Welcome everyone. My name is Mathieu Roy. I am assistant professor in psychology at McGill and I am going to be the host for this seventh and last event of our mini science series on the brain. We are located on the downtown campus of McGill's university. We are on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg nations. McGill has long recognized and honored these nations as the traditional stewards of the land and waters that we work on and meet on to exchange and learn from each other. To introduce our speakers on this evening is the mini science series organizer, Ingrid Berger. I'm very pleased to be here with Dr. Cecilia Flores and Dr. Anna Weinberg. Cecilia Flores is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and an associate member in the Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery. The overall theme of her research is the neurobiology of brain development in adolescence and how it is impacted by stressors and drugs of abuse. Using multidisciplinary and translational approaches, her team has demonstrated that a set of guidance cue genes and their epigenetic regulators orchestrate the development of the prefrontal cortex in adolescence and are tightly linked to substance use disorder and major depression in humans. Her work has been consistently funded by international and national agencies, including the National Institutes of Health and the CIHR. Anna Weinberg is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology and the Canada Research Chair in Clinical Neuroscience at McGill. She is also the lab director at the Translational Research in Affect and Cognition Lab, known as TRAC. Her research there focuses on patterns of neutral response that might give rise to psychopathology. Her lab frequently uses event-related potentials, ERPs, a direct measure of brain function in humans across the lifespan. The goal of this research is to understand sources of variation in these neural responses and ultimately identify biological pathways that give rise to depression and anxiety. Dr. Flores will begin this evening. She will be followed by Dr. Weinberg, and then we will have a moderated question and answer period. Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today in this beautiful day of May. Adolescence is a transition period from childhood to adulthood. It entails a significant amount of growth. It encompasses puberty, and it also encompasses a significant amount of brain maturation. Adolescence not only occurs in humans, but also in other species, such as mice. And in fact, we can make equivalent uh, uh, assumptions of a specific adolescent, adolescent ages in humans and adolescent uh, ages in mice, although of course the adolescent period in rodents is much shorter than in humans. Adolescence is also characterized, as many of you uh, uh, may be aware of, by enhanced psychiatric vulnerability. For example, symptoms of psychiatric disorders such as mood disorders or substance use start emerging during this age. But in adolescence, behaviors such as the drug and reward seeking, risk taking and impulsive behavior are very prominent more than in any other age. And the, it is thought that the combination of this psychiatric risk with these increasing behaviors may pose individuals at this uh, uh, risk. But the neurobiological processes that are at play are not clearly uh, unraveled. However, there is consensus that the fact that the prefrontal cortex is still developing in adolescence plays a causal role. Yes, the prefrontal cortex that is present in humans is also present in other species such as mice. And in both humans and rodents, the prefrontal cortex continues to mature until early adulthood. And this is in contrast to other brain systems such as the limbic system, which has achieves adult uh, uh, levels much earlier than the prefrontal cortex. It is interesting to mention that the development of the prefrontal cortex in adolescence occurs in parallel with the refinement of impulse control and other cognitive uh, processing. 
And it's important to mention impulse control because this uh, ability seems to be disrupted in psychiatric disorders of adolescent onset. But of course, not all adolescents are uh, equally vulnerable to, to psychiatric disorders in adolescence. There are some that are actually resilient when exposed to similar adverse experiences, for example, and some are affected but in different manners. And in my laboratory, we're trying to unravel cellular and molecular processes that are occurring in, in the adolescent brain and to characterize whether and how experiences that are common during this age affect these developmental processes. We and other labs are focusing on a very interesting uh, system, brain system, that is the dopaminergic system. Here is a sagittal section of a mouse brain. Here would be the nostril and here the tail. And the dopaminergic neurons that we're interested in have the cell bodies in the ventral tegmental area or VTA. And these dopamine neurons send axons to limbic regions such as the nucleus accumbens or to the prefrontal cortex. And what is been very interesting and known for several years now is that the density of dopamine axons in the prefrontal cortex continues to increase from adolescence to adulthood. And this is in contrast to the density of dopamine axons in limbic regions with reaches adult density like levels early in life. And this protracted increase in density of dopamine axons in the cortex is seen in rodents, in non-human primates, and is known to, to exist also in humans. But it was not until recently that we actually discovered in my laboratory what is the process that mediates this protracted increase in density of dopamine axons in the cortex. We actually discovered that the dopamine axons are still growing from the nucleus accumbens all the way to the prefrontal cortex adolescence. What we did is we took adolescent mice and we infected them with two viruses, one at the level of the nucleus accumbens, one at the levels of the ventral tegmental area, in a way that dopamine neurons that would have already reached the nucleus accumbens in adolescence will become fluorescent. And we thought that if the axons would continue to grow from this region to the prefrontal cortex in adulthood, we would be able to see fluorescent dopamine fibers in the cortex. And that's exactly what we observed. And we were very excited because this is the first demonstration of long distance axonal growth occurring so late in postnatal life. This process is very common in embryonic life or very early postnatal development. And also because obviously these dopamine axons that are still growing such a long distance for a prolonged period of time remain very vulnerable to the environment, to environmental changes. And the, something to mention again is that impulse control in adulthood is actually mediated by proper dopamine function and connectivity in the prefrontal cortex. So going a little bit uh, uh, on another line of work that we have, in collaboration with Matthew Paul in the United States, we've been uh, doing experiments in Siberian hamsters. And what is known about these Siberian hamsters is that they can have their puberty at a regular time or actually delay it depending on when they are born so as to maximize that their offspring will survive. If the hamsters are born in the summer, they will have the puberty soon after. However, if they're born in the winter, they're going to delay their puberty to, to the spring or early summer in order to secure that their offspring will survive. And these uh, uh, long uh, uh, daylight days or short daylight dates can be reproduced in the lab using photoperiod. So we use photoperiod and look at the growth of dopamine axons from the nucleus accumbens to the cortex in these Siberian hamsters. And we observe that the ones that are born in the summer have this adolescent growth uh, that we see in mice, and it actually continues into adulthood. However, when we look at the hamsters that are born in winter-like conditions, this adolescent uh, growth of dopamine axons is actually delayed to, to adulthood. And we are very interested in this because this also occurs in parallel with behaviors that are very common to pick in adolescents that are delayed uh, uh, also in the hamsters that are in winter paralleling this uh, uh, growth in, 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 in dopamine axons. <clears throat> 
So how this is happening? So we're focusing on guidance cues, which are very interesting proteins that can uh, mediate neuronal connectivity. And uh, we study Netrin-1 with Dr. Kennedy already talked about this in the mini series. Netrin-1 is interesting because it's bifunctional. It can actually attract axons or repel them depending on the receptors this axon express. We focus for this talk on the DCC a receptor, which is responsive for the attractive function of Netrin-1, but there are other receptors that are actually repelled by Netrin-1. And something to mention is that in, in addition of axonal growth, Netrin and DCC are important for target recognition. That is in decisions that the axons have to be making in, in intermediate points before they reach their final target. And Netrin and its receptors are expressed across the lifespan and their function in different developmental stages, including in, in, in adulthood in the mature brain seem to be different. It's uh, clear that the balance between attracted and repellent receptors mediate the spatial temporal function of Netrin-1, and we have characterized expression of Netrin-1 and, and, and receptors in the dopaminergic system, and we discovered that there is a target-dependent expression. To summarize these findings, the dopamine axons that innervate the nucleus accumbens express very high levels of DCC, but the post-target, the, the, the neurons in the nucleus accumbens express low levels of Netrin-1. And the opposite is, is, it happens in the prefrontal cortex where the dopamine axons ex express very little DCC, but there are high levels of Netrin-1 expression in these regions. And in fact, we found that if we conduct the same experiment that I described in, in adolescent mice, but in addition of turning dopamine neurons fluorescence, we also decrease their levels of DCC in adolescence. What we find is that that manipulation triggers ectopic growth of axons that were supposed to stay in the nucleus accumbens to instead continue to grow to the prefrontal cortex. So the number of fluorescent axons is significantly greater when we reduce DCC in these dopamine neurons in adolescence. And the same happens if instead of, instead of reducing DCC in dopamine axons, we reduce Netrin-1 in the nucleus accumbens. So we can add a, a, a one piece of information, and that is that Netrin and DCC play a role in dopamine target recognition decisions in adolescents. How do dopamine axons reach the prefrontal cortex? We're investigating this process. I just want to mention very briefly, now we're looking at the brain from the front, is that when axons leave the nucleus accumbens, they form a bundle and together they reach the prefrontal cortex. And they do that, they seem, by following a gradient of neurons that express high levels of Netrin-1 and that uh, the, level, the levels of expression of Netrin-1 in these neurons is higher in the cortex than in the nucleus accumbens, so they travel along a gradient. And in fact, if we knock out Netrin-1 along this path, the axons do not reach the cortex, they reach other brain regions. To study the consequences of varying Netrin-1 or DCC function, in prefrontal cortex function and behavior, we've been using DCC haplin sufficient mouse models, but also we've been working with humans that are also DCC haplin sufficient. These uh, uh, humans with DCC haplin sufficiency were first identified here at McGill by Guy Rouleau. And we've been finding that in both humans and DCC haplin sufficient mice, there are changes in drug reward sensitivity, risk taking and impulse behaviors in adulthood, as well as the organization of the mesocorticolimbic circuitry. And these experiments in humans have been done in collaboration with Marco Layton here at McGill. So two points about this is the expression in adolescence. One is that this is the expression in dopamine neurons is under microRNA control, microRNA, are small non-RNA uh, molecules that actually prevent gene transcription or gene expression. And uh, they're very interesting because there are epigenetic processes that are mediated by these small molecules. And they, they're proposed to be molecular links between environmental factors and changes in gene transcription observed in psychiatric conditions. But because they're small, they're very stable and they can be measured in peripheral fluids. And they're known, the, the, the microRNAs 
to travel in vesicles and, the, uh, and to be released from cells, including neurons into peripheral tissues. And we discovered MIR-218 as a microRNA that actually is a strong repressor of DCC expression in neurons of mice and humans, including dopamine neurons. And the other point is that we have found using postmortem brain tissue, human postmortem brain tissue, that DCC and MIR-218 are dysregulated in psychiatric disorders that emerge in adolescence, including major depressive disorder. And their dysregulation goes in an opposite direction, suggesting that the changes in MIR-218 are causing the changes in DCC mRNA. And since these early studies that we conducted, there have been more and more studies, including some from our lab and some by other groups at McGill, showing that genetic variation in DCC and Etrin 1 is associated with psychiatric disorders, many of them of adolescent onset, including mood disorders, substance use, and schizophrenia. So one of the questions that we've been trying to address is whether experiences that are common in adolescence, for example, exposure to drugs of abuse or to social stress, could regulate MIR-218, Netrin-1, and or DCC in dopamine systems and in adolescence, and change the way the prefrontal cortex uh, uh, dopamine connection develops. I'm gonna tell you briefly about our studies with amphetamines. It's important to study drugs of abuse in adolescence because most individuals begin experimenting with these drugs of abuse, including a stimulant drugs in adolescence. And unfortunately, the use of amphetamines seems to be increasing in adolescence. We uh, uh, administer amphetamine to adolescent male and female mice. And although we administer the drug uh, uh, ourselves, we know that the doses that we use can be equivalent to recreational like doses used in humans, including adolescents, and that this amphetamine treatment has rewarding effects. When we uh, test whether this amphetamine treatment in mice can actually alter DCC or MIR2 expression, MIR2 expression in dopamine neurons, we find that in males, actually, this treatment downregulates. DCC by increasing MIR-218 in dopamine neurons. But when we look at these uh, uh, effects in females, we find that females are insensitive to these changes. Furthermore, in males, amphetamine also regulates netrin-1 in the nucleus accumbens, implying that there is a double effect by amphetamine reducing DCC receptor in dopamine axons and netrin-1 in their target in the nucleus accumbens in adolescence. So we thought that this must induce a robust rerouting of dopamine axons that are supposed to stay in the nucleus accumbens to the cortex, and this is the case. This is a piece of prefrontal cortex of an adult mice that receives saline or is a control group in, in adolescence, and you can see these are the fluorescent dopamine axons indicating that the axons continue to grow. But in the adult prefrontal cortex of an animal that receives amphetamine in adolescence, you can see that the number of fluorescent fibers is significantly, dramatically high. To start studying the consequences of these changes in connectivity, we've been also testing adult mice that receive amphetamine or saline in adolescence in, a, a, in the go-no-go -no -go task, which can assess impulse control, because if the animal emits a behavior when it's not supposed to do that, it's considered a commission error and a sign of impulsivity. And we're very interested in impulse control because it's known to be a behavioral trust associated with psychiatric risk, for example, substance use disorder. And what we're finding in these adult mice that receive amphetamine in adulthood is that instead of improving their ability to inhibit their behavior over days or trials as the animals that receive saline in adolescence, they actually remain very impulsive across several days. But when we test females that are given amphetamine or saline in adolescence, we don't find changes in impulse control in adulthood. Uh, and this is, we think, is related to the fact that this amphetamine treatment fails to, 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 to alter DCC and Netrin-1 and MIR-218 at this age in females. And just very briefly, I want to tell you that we use microRNAs to see if we can predict vulnerability 
in adolescent humans, in an adolescent mice, because when we manipulate, for example, MIR-218 in the brain, we can induce same changes in the blood. So we are now conducting studies in both human samples, blood human samples, uh, uh, or in mice also of uh, uh, blood samples of adolescent mice. And we're trying to see if by looking about uh, at the microRNA profile of these samples, we can actually learn something about what's going on in the brain. And we can also predict who could be at more risk for developed psychiatric disorders in the hope for later on help uh, 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 with the development of prevention and intervention strategies. So just to conclude in adolescence, these disease receptors determine when and where dopamine axons connect. Convergent findings from human studies and mice implicate this netrin system in psychiatric disorders of adolescent onset. Experiences may influence, influence psychiatric vulnerability by altering this guidance cue system in a sex-specific manner, and all this is mediated by epigenetic processes. And the, we believe that many other changes that are happening in the cortex, such as increased myelination or synaptic pruning, are all affected by these experiences, but the converging mechanism is the development of the dopaminergic system. And the, all this is thank you to a great team that I have in, in my laboratory that make all this work possible. Thank you. Hey, um, Cecilia, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Um, so I am going to be uh, also talking about um, things kind of tangentially related to the dopaminergic system, um, but looking primarily, well, no, I'm sorry, exclusively in humans. So I'm a professor in the Department of Psychology and specifically in the area of clinical psychology. So I study mental illness and risk for mental illness. And in particular, um, I'm very interested in depression and anxiety, as well as risk for those disorders. And I actually came to research on the period of adolescence through my interest in depression, which I'll explain shortly. So I'm just gonna start a little bit by talking about depression, um, if I can advance. Okay, so depression or major depressive disorder um, or MDD is a really is a substantial public health concern. So uh, by some estimates, as many as one in five uh, people in North America will experience depression or, or MDD in their lifetimes. Um, it's among the most common and costly forms of, dis of disease and injury worldwide, and it's occurring at increasingly younger ages and is now uh, highest in mid-adolescence, particularly for girls. So we also know that juvenile onset uh, depression tends to follow a very chronic course and is associated with longer and more frequent episodes, as well as greater impairment, uh, greater risk for suicide, and uh, increased odds of hospitalization. And heightened symptoms of depression are even more, more common with estimates in adolescence, sometimes as high as 50%. Um, adolescence is also the period during which depression becomes twice as common in women and girls as it is in boys and men. And we know that targeted prevention efforts, so, so trying to identify people at risk and prevent the onset of depression, those are effective for some people. So they can reduce the incidence of depressive disorders but the effect sizes for those tend to be rather modest. And really the success of preventions uh, hinges in important ways on our ability to improve targets. So really to identify specifically who is at greatest risk for the disorder. Uh, but our ability to improve our targets may be hampered by um, a number of problems with the definition of depression uh, because there are many, many different ways to be depressed and there are many different pathways to depression. So one such target that we've been looking at in our lab, so a target that will help us identify more specific phenotypes is reward sensitivity. So um, the reason that so many people focus on reward and reward insensitivity is because it is a core symptom of depression um, called anhedonia. And this is defined clinically as a loss of interest or pleasure in things that were formerly interesting or pleasurable. And it's not only a core symptom of major depressive disorder, but there's also some evidence that's quite central and causal to other symptoms. It predicts poor response to antidepressants and to CBT. And there's some evidence that it is heritable. So it's, uh, it's influenced by genetic uh, factors. 
It's also associated with hyporesponsivity in a brain network that's implicated in reward processing, including some that Dr. Flores was just discussing. So including regions of the brain like the prefrontal cortex, the dorsal striatum, the nucleus accumbens, and also the amygdala. So these regions of the brain also undergo substantial changes and development during the period of adolescence. So adolescence, as Dr. Flores defined, is a decade of life in which the brain experiences rapid neural maturation and also plasticity. And it begins roughly with the onset of puberty. So around age 10 in girls and 12 in boys and lasts for nearly a decade. So um, it, as I said this already, that there are substantial changes. And some of these changes uh, are no doubt, I was gonna say are likely to be, but are, are in fact definitely driven by um, uh, changes that are happening in the adolescent social milieu. So uh, this is a topic of ongoing study, but there are so many things about the adolescent experience that are different from the experience of, of childhood. But also we do know that some of those changes are driven uh, directly by increases in gonadal hormones. Um, and uh, so this is some of the stuff that I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, and what is relatively well established, and as Dr. Flores was talking about, is that in adolescence, we see a peak in reward sensitivity and, and specifically a peak in mid-adolescence. And this can be you know, measured neurally, it can be measured behaviorally, but what we see is that it's higher in mid-adolescence than in both children and um, in young adults. And really this peak uh, makes some sense if we think about the general functions of responding to rewards. So, so why do we need to have a neural response, a strong neural response to rewards? So we need to have neural signals that, that tell us what is rewarding in order to understand when something that we have done has resulted in a positive outcome, because then we can repeat those behaviors to make the rewards happen again. And being sensitive to rewards also allows us to face the risks that we often have to uh, face in order to pursue rewards. So if we weren't sensitive to the rewarding possibility of a new relationship, then we might never risk the possibility of rejection to ask people out, for example. And um, then if we think about the developmental tasks of adolescent, then this adolescent peak in reward sensitivity also makes a lot of sense because adolescence is often very much about taking risks and moving at least a little bit away from the safety of the family. So establishing new relationships outside of that a family unit um, about pursuing educational goals. So it's all about understanding how to balance risk and reward. Although as Dr. Flores was saying, that can go wrong in the other way than what I'll, I'm talking about. And then of course, in some people who don't have these strong neural responses to rewards, what happens? So in trying to understand risk for depression, we and others have been asking what happens for people who enter this period with a reduced tendency to pursue rewards and take risks, or people who don't show this normative peak in reward sensitivity. Um, and, and the belief is that this might explain some portion of the variance in depression increases during the period of adolescence. So in my lab, uh, we study this question using a direct measure of neural response called event-related potentials or ERPs. And ERPs are uh, scalp-recorded neural activity. So each of the sensors that you see here in this cap um, are uh, transmitting the electrical activity back to the, uh, of the brain back to an amplifier. Uh, and that means because we're measuring uh, the electrical activity of the brain that they have excellent temporal resolution. So virtually uh, what we measure at the level of the scalp is virtually instantaneous with what's occurring in the brain. Um, and ERPs also typically are measuring the activity of postsynaptic potential. So very large populations of neurons firing together. And some of the benefits of ERPs are um, that they are relatively inexpensive to administer, relatively well tolerated, um, and there are very few contraindications for this. So it's possible to run very large and diverse samples across the developmental spectrum. So we can collect uh, brain data from babies and also from senior citizens relatively easily. And when we were looking at ERPs, um, these are neural responses that are time locked to an event. So a stimulus onset or a behavioral response and then averaged over many, many trials. So here we have time on the x-axis in milliseconds, again, pointing to the excellent temporal resolution of ERPs and the amplitude of the component on the y-axis. So the onset of a stimulus might be a picture on a screen and that's at time zero. And then we see the response, the, the neural response unfolding in time after that. 
Um, per a kind of a perverse convention of the ERP world, positive is plotted down. Um, so you will just have to keep reminding yourself of that when I talk about positive going components. Uh, and there are a lot of different ERP components that are discussed in relation to the development of depression and psychopathology. But today I'm going to be focusing on the reward positivity or RUPI. And uh, the RUPI is sensitive to rewards, as you might expect from the name. So one of the things that we do in the lab, or one of the ways that we measure the RUPI, is by using a monetary reward guessing task, where participants see uh, an image with two doors on the screen, and they're told to guess which door hides a prize. So they make their guess, and then they're given feedback that either they won money, or so they guessed correctly, and they won 50 cents, or they guessed incorrectly, and they lost 25 cents. And what we see when we're looking at the neural responses to these stimuli that are appearing on the screen is a positivity, a positive going deflection in the waveform appearing here at about 250 or 350 milliseconds after the onset of that feedback. So here we see a positivity that's enhanced for positive feedback relative to negative feedback or feedback about monetary losses. And um, the difference between those is expressed here as a gain minus loss difference. So it has this very characteristic uh, central parietal, sorry, front of central scalp distribution where we're seeing more red means a larger difference between those two conditions. So the RUPI has been associated with activation of the mesocortical limbic circuit, um, including uh, the ventral striatum and the medial prefrontal cortex. And it's associated with other uh, diff individual differences in reward sensitivity, including self-reported reward sensitivity and uh, behavioral metrics of reward-driven response biases. So in one of our studies, we were looking at the association between the willingness to take risks and neural responses to reward measured by the RUPI across the period of adolescence. So um, we looked at this in 63 female adolescents between the ages of 10 and 19. And we looked at neural responses to reward in the DOORS task that I was just talking about, but also um, willingness to take risks in the balloon analog risk task or the BART. So in this task, uh, participants are told that they need to decide that they have to inflate a balloon and they need to decide how many pumps they want to make to inflate that balloon. So you get points for each pump that you uh, use, but if the balloon pops, so if you pump too many times, um, then the balloon will pop and you get no points. So it's a nice behavioral measure of uh, sensitivity to the rewards associated with um, inflating the balloon correctly and willingness to take risks. So first we look at the willingness to take risks or, or pumps on the BART task and associations with age in months. So we see this very uh, well-established quadratic association, right? So adolescents around the age of 14 are more likely to take more risks, so they're gonna pump more times to obtain greater reward than both younger adolescent uh, girls and older adolescent girls. But we also see that age moderates the association between neural responses to rewards and risks. So for these, sorry, for younger adolescents in red, <laughs> there is no association between neural response to rewards and risky behaviors. And it's really only around mid-adolescence and later when neural response to rewards also peaks, that we see a significant and positive association between neural responses to rewards and a willingness to take risks to obtain those rewards. Um, but we also see that those with a small neural response to rewards, even these later developmental periods, remain pretty unlikely or unwilling to take risks to receive rewards, even into the period where it might be adaptive and indeed necessary to complete those key developmental tasks that we were talking about earlier. Um, so one of the things that we were asking is how does this relate to depression? And um, particularly, how can we understand or how can we use this information to understand risk for depression? Well, one thing that we can try to do is map these neural responses onto groups of people that we know to be at higher risk for depression to see if those groups of people also show abnormalities in neural responses to rewards before they're ill. And this is typically compared to people who are at a lower risk of developing depression. So one of our best predictors of who will go on to become depressed is having a family history of depression. So people who have mothers or fathers, or to a lesser extent, grandparents and aunts and uncles 
are at higher risk for developing depression. And in fact, there's some evidence that people with a family history of depression are at something like three to five times increased risk. And there's also evidence that adolescent daughters of moms with history of depression are at particularly high risk. But, but why is that? Um, so that's a question that we've been really grappling with in our lab. What is being transmitted across generations that could result in this heightened risk for depression? Well, one possibility is that what is transmitted is a blunted neural response to rewards. So to look at this um, first, we wanted to see is the rupee, is this neural response familial? So that is in a sample of adult siblings, is the rupee correlated or associated within sibling pairs? And, and we find that it is. Um, so what we're seeing here is that the, the rupee of sibling one is positively correlated with the rupee of sibling two. So if I have a large rupee, if I have a large neural response to rewards, then my brother is also likely to have a large rupee. Uh, but of course, this is in a sample of adult siblings, and there's a lot of different reasons that adult siblings could be similar to one another. And what we're most often interested in is whether these signals are related across generations. So to look at questions of intergenerational transmission of reward sensitivity and depression, we have recruited a sample of women with a history of depression or uh, no history of depression, and they're never depressed adolescent daughters. And um, what we see is that in low risk mothers, so mothers who um, have never had depression or any other psychiatric psychological disorders, um, there, there's a large difference, and you can see that here as well, between neural responses to positive outcomes in the environment and neural responses to negative events in the environment. Um, and just to note that I, we process these data differently from this in the study, so the waveforms look a little different, but you can really look to the scalp distributions to see uh, the differences in the magnitudes. But uh, when we look now at the moms who have a history of depression, even though when they came to our lab, they were currently euthymic, so not currently depressed, and we look at what their brain responses look like, then we see um, a near absence or in fact a flip of this effect. So these moms with a history of depression, even though they're no longer depressed, are now showing a larger neural response to negative feedback from the environment compared to positive feedback from the environment. And then of course, our major question was, do we also see this in their never depressed daughters? So daughters who are at heightened risk by virtue of family history, but who have never been clinically depressed. And what we see is in fact, yes. So compared to these low risk daughters, so never depressed daughters of mothers with a history of depression, the high risk daughters show the same effect as their moms, where they're showing a larger neural response to negative feedback from the environment than they are to positive feedback from the environment. So uh, high risk daughters have this blunted social, or sorry, rupee to rewards, even in the absence of significant symptom, symptoms. So this suggests that um, there is an association within families and across generations in neural responses to rewards. But we also wanted to know that um, what would, what, whether having a family history of depression would predict or tell us anything about normative developmental effects across adolescents. So we know that compared to their low risk peers, these high risk adolescent daughters have a smaller neural response to rewards. But again, as uh, Dr. Flores also discussed, those neural systems that generate these responses change substantially across adolescents. So how might a family history of depression affect these normative developmental pathways? So we looked here at whether the association between daughter's rupee and their degree of pubertal development was moderated or affected by their risk status. And we find this interaction effect. So um, the association, what we see here is essentially that the association between daughter's neural response to reward and her self-reported pubertal development differs depending on mother's depression history. So that is for those at low risk for depression, as pubertal development increases, so do neural responses to rewards. But for those at higher risk, so those, those daughters who have this maternal history of depression, we see the opposite effect. So now, um, with increasing pubertal development, we're seeing decreasing neural responses to rewards. So given that we know that a blunted neural response to reward has been shown to prospectively predict depression, um, even over and above other risk factors, it's possible that these girls at higher risk for depression due to a family history of the disorder become increasingly vulnerable across adolescents. 
Um, and these data are also consistent with evidence suggesting that the heritability of depression increases across adolescence. But another question that we've really been interested in is why? So why would having a blunt, why would having a blunted neural response to rewards make people more likely to become depressed? And one possibility that we've been pursuing is that it makes them more sensitive to the effects of exposure to stressful life events. So um, stress is also a very strong predictor of the onset of depression, uh, particularly interpersonal stress. And adolescence is a period of heightened stress exposure. So adolescents are suddenly experiencing more stress and also heightened stress sensitivity. So they are showing more of the adverse effects associated with stress exposure. And peers in particular are a major source of both stress and support during adolescence. So the, a large focus of our research has been on interpersonal stress during the period of adolescence. And um, one of the things that we looked at, uh, so let <laughs> me just move out that transition, um, we also looked at whether or not uh, at a late adolescent group um, would show uh, susceptibility to stress associated with the COVID-19 pandemic if they had a smaller neural response to rewards. Um, so I'm assuming everyone is familiar with this pandemic, but the method here was we had 121 participants who had attended a pre-pandemic lab visit where they completed uh, a reward task while EEG was recorded. And one thing to note here is that um, under conditions that were relatively low stress, the RUP was not associated with symptoms of depression at the sample at baseline. But then beginning in March of 2020, we sent participants eight surveys assessing symptoms of depression and the kinds of stress exposure they experienced during the pandemic um, from March to August of 2020. And uh, we stopped in August of 2020 because we were quite certain that the pandemic would have been over for months by then and we would be able to measure recovery as well. Um, but uh, of course that did not happen. So what did we find? So we find that the RUPI, so the magnitude of neural responses to positive events in the environment does predict how depressed our participants became over the course of those early months of the pandemic. So those with a smaller RUPI at baseline showed higher symptoms of depression over this early part of the pandemic, even adjusting for baseline depression, depression symptoms. So other groups have found similar results looking at exposure to financial and family stress during the pandemic, um, exposure to lifetime interpersonal stress in a, in a sample of late adolescents, um, stress during midterm exams. So we looked at that in McGill University uh, undergraduates and um, positive interpersonal images uh, were associated, the neural responses to positive interpersonal images were associated with uh, how people respond to the pandemic. So, what these data suggest and what our program suggests is that multiple factors are associated with the functioning of neural circuitry responsible for reward processing in adolescence. And a blunted neural response to rewards may make adolescents more vulnerable to the effects of stress during a more stressful period and a period during which they are already vulnerable to the effects of stress. And that may also make them less likely to accomplish some of these key tasks of this developmental period like gaining independence and preparing for future career goals. And then these factors could then lead to an increased likelihood of developing depression. So a lot of the work in our lab is to try to start intervening here and here in hopes of reducing stress susceptibility, improving uh, outcomes and promoting better mental health for more of the population. So uh, thank you very much all, to all of you for your attention and time and uh, to our funders and especially to the trainees in my lab, uh, without whom this work would definitely not be possible. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, Cecilia. We'll start the questions actually with, um, with Anna Weinberg. Anna, Anna, the first question is, are there situations under which a larger neural response to rewards during adolescence might be maladaptive? Um, yeah, so that's a great question. And I mean, I almost want to uh, punt to Dr. Flores because I think she could probably answer that. So, you know, so the kind of, I talked very much about blunted neural responses um, being uh, predictive of depression, but there's also evidence that having larger neural responses to rewards and being more reward sensitive could, as Dr. Flores was showing in many ways, could make people more susceptible to um, disorders like uh, substance use or um, alcohol use disorders, 
or um, disorders associated with impulsivity. So certainly, yeah, you know, it's not that more is always better in terms of psychological or mental health outcomes. Dr. Flores, would you like to add to that? No, I think that's an excellent answer and the, right. the good point have... that it's related to both of us, yes. We do have a question for you, Dr. Flores. Could positive experiences in adolescence have beneficial effects via modifications to the developing dopamine system? Yes, I, I, I definitely think so. We, we, we're trying to study that in the lab, but I think uh, that's the good news about the plasticity of the development of the dopamine system, that it can go again both ways. And we think that an enrichment environment, for example, in rodents is defin definitely beneficial as well as uh, low doses of amphetamine, for example, also seem to increase uh, performance in the go no -go task in adult. Okay. Dr. Weinberg, do you see sex or gender differences in your work? Um, so this is something that we've been really trying to uh, pursue and figure out in our research because there are very, very well documented uh, gender differences in the development of depression, uh, and particularly during the period of adolescence. Uh, so this is when girls suddenly become much more likely to develop depression compared to boys. And that's an imbalance that persists across the lifespan. So women are also much more likely to uh, be diagnosed with depression compared to men. Um, and so we have really been trying to understand that. Um, you may have noticed that a lot of the work I presented was only in uh, girls and women because of this heightened uh, vulnerability. Um, but one of the things that we're trying to look at now is whether stress interacts with reward uh, in the same way for both adolescent boys and girls to predict outcomes. Um, so far, we have no indication that it, it interacts differently so that, that it look, the effects look the same for both uh, boys and girls, which is really striking considering, you know, the very strong sex differences that we see uh, in animal models, as, as Dr. Flores was presenting, but also in just, uh, you know, the clinical epidemiology of the disorder. Yeah. Dr. Flores, do all drugs of abuse impact the guidance cue systems that control dopamine and prefrontal cortex development? We've been uh, studying other drugs, for example, one that is very, very uh, much uh, common in, in adolescence uh, these days is cannabis. So uh, what we're finding is that exposure to this drug in rodents also dysregulate the, the, the systems that I mentioned, but uh, uh, the effects are, are different than stimulant drugs and also the, the specific age in adolescence where they dysregulate this system. So I think experiences in general can affect positive and negative experience, can affect these systems and in turn the development of the dopamine system and the prefrontal cortex, but all the changes are dependent on the type of experience and the age of adolescence and also sex seems to, to matter. Great. Um, Dr. Weinberg. If neural responses to reward are influenced by genes, does that mean we can't intervene on them? Um, yeah, so this is a question that we that we get a lot because you know we we do in my work propose these as a potential target for intervention. So, so if you know if they can play a mechanistic role in the development of depression, then maybe we can actually work directly on these reward systems in humans and you know through a variety of, of means to improve outcomes. Um, and so, I mean, I think we still have a long way to go to establish that this is a mechanism of depression. However, um, you know, what we always talk about in my lab is just because something is heritable or just because something is subject to genetic influence does not mean it's immutable. So, so genetic influence is probabilistic, it's not deterministic. So it determines the range of possible outcomes um, under the right circumstances, but it doesn't determine the absolute value of an outcome. And so, so just because you may be uh, genetically pre predisposed to have a blunted neural response to rewards does not mean that that's kind of a, you know, that you're doomed uh, and that, that you still can't, that it's not sensitive still to environmental influence or learning. Dr. Flores, could some drugs have, did I do this one? Could some drugs have beneficial effects? I did that one. No, I think you asked me if all drugs could have the same effects. Oh. So this one is specifically 
could some drugs have beneficial effects on the adolescent developing brain? Yes, I think this is a very important point to clarify, particularly because uh, I, I, as I explained in my talk, I talk about amphetamines, but as we know, amphetamines are very much prescribed in adolescents for therapeutic purposes. So we've been investigating in the lab the effects of a lower doses of amphetamine that would resemble more the therapeutic uh, uh, doses. And what we actually find is that the consequences of, of, of these drugs are very different to the high doses. And in fact, when it comes to impulse control, those doses improve overall performance in the go-no-go -no -go task. So of course, our mice have not been diagnosed with any disorder, but I think it's very important to clarify that the dose matters very much and that not all is bad news. Mm -hmm. Those were the, the questions that came in. Um, I don't have anything else. Dr. Wa, do you have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I might have a couple of questions for, uh, uh, for Anna and Cecilia. So I'll, I'll, I'll try a, a first question that, that will aim at bridging their, their two presentations. Um, so I, I was wondering if the, the RUPI, the, the reward positivity, if it has been shown to be related to the connectivity in the mesolimbic dopamine system to structural uh, features of the brain. Is there a link between the two that has been made? Um, so there is links that have been made to functional um, activation, but, but few, you know, I'm actually not aware of any that have looked at the, the structural connectivity. Um, the, the, I mean, as, as you know, uh, Dr. Gua, the, the, one of the problems with ERPs is that because they're reflecting the electrical activity of um, the brain, that, that signal emanating from the sources is subject to spread. And so um, doing precise localization in terms of the neuroanatomy of those signals is, is really difficult because of, just because of the physical, you know, constraints of the signal. Um, so, I mean, of course, there are, there are ways to get around that, but it, it, it can become very complicated uh, and requires a higher density than we typically use. Thank you, but, but you've mentioned that it, it is correlated to functional connectivity in uh, in that system. Functional, so act, to activity. Oh, activity. But, the, but I don't, yeah, I mean, so, so and, and it is associated with activity in, and, and that was not done with simultaneous recording of fMRI and EEG. That was typically the same task in the scanner one day and then EEG. So the magnitude of the rupee in people is associated with the magnitude of responses in the, you know, the VMPFC and um, striatum. Uh, but, but people typically want more precise answers than that. Yeah. And um, another thing that, 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 surprised me when I was listening to your talk. So I'm, I'm not an expert on, on depression, but when I'm, I think about depression, I intuitively think about uh, increased threat sensitivity. Uh, and, and here, both of you seem to be showing that it, it, you know, it's not necessarily just that it, you know, blunted responses to rewards uh, also have an effect. And uh, Dr. Flores also just suggested that this, this might be a, a new avenue um, to explore in, in terms of a, a treatment. Um, so I was wondering what, what do you think is the relationship between uh, blunted reward sensitivity on one hand and um, uh, increased threat sensitivity on the other? Are, are those two unrelated things or they are somehow related to one another? Do you want to, to answer that, Dr. Weinberg? <laughs> I mean, I can, I can answer, you know, from the perspective of depression, um, but I, I'd be eager to hear your thoughts as well. So, I, you know, when we think about um, the clinical literature, uh, one of the things that we know about depression is it is very, very close. Uh, it's, it's very frequently co-occurring with anxiety, and it can be often really difficult to disentangle effects that are observed due to depression from effects that are due to uh, the co-occurring anxiety. So in just kind of modeling symptoms, when people are trying to model the structure of symptoms and how they co-occur and what are the independent factors, um, sensitivity to threat is more often associated with symptoms of anxiety. And this blunted reward sensitivity is the specific aspect to uh, depression and depressive disorders. So um, that is to say that, that if we're thinking about what is unique about depression from other disorders, it's this blunted reward sensitivity Although 
in some depressed individuals, you do observe this heightened threat sensitivity, but, but certainly not in all. So that doesn't actually replicate that well across um, depressed individuals. So what is the relationship between them, I think, is a really interesting question um, because, you know, it depends on what type of threat you're talking about. But if it's the threat of, you know, so if it's a threat that you necessarily have to pass through in order to obtain rewards, then there's a very tight linkage, I think, between those constructs. You know, if it's a fear of spiders and you can avoid the spiders, then we're talking about probably something a little bit different, at least uh, at least in my world. Um, mm-hmm. But I think it's very interesting to think about the way that those two um dimensions intersect to predict psychopathology. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Flores and Dr. Weinberg for these uh, two very uh, interesting uh, talks. Um, So now I would like to uh, thank you more officially with a gift. Uh, So you are going to receive a postcard from the Red Path Museum. So it's a stereoscopic uh, postcard. So when you open it up, uh, and look through it, you will get to see this uh, dinosaur in 3D. And I've, I've tested it and it works uh, quite well. Um, so the Repat Museum is uh, Canada's oldest museum. It is located at McGill. Uh, it was opened in 1882 and it used to be open to the public, but unfortunately it is currently temporarily closed, uh, but they are still uh, working. And we are also going to be sending you some of the museum's uh, publications, which are accessible at the gift shop. Uh, so you still have access to the museum's uh, exhibit uh, through uh, the books. So for instance, here we have all of the minerals that are in the uh, museum's uh, mineral gallery. Um, and the last part of our gift is this uh, face mask from uh, the Faculty of Science, uh, Science Outreach Team, uh, that you'll uh, be able to keep as a souvenir of this uh, series of online presentations. Uh, and uh, I hope that you will still uh, be able to receive it uh, while um, while the masks are still uh, mandatory. Um, <laughs> and uh, finally, the, the Red Pad is also running a fundraising campaign. Uh, the outreach team is currently building discovery boxes where instead of schools uh, coming to the museums, uh, uh, they can send these boxes in the schools, uh, especially in remote and underserved communities. Uh, and we would really like to have these boxes full of amazing things for kids like uh, minerals, fossils, uh, skeletons, bones, etc. And so this campaign is running as part of uh, Miguel, Miguel 24 crowdfunding. It ends on May 12th. Uh, all donations are welcome. Um, so thank you again, uh, everybody, for being with us uh, tonight. Uh, and I would like to thank all of the speakers uh, uh, and staff for this uh, wonderful series of talk. Uh, with uh, special thanks to uh, Ingrid Berker, Stuart McCombie, Jonathan Roy, Fergus uh, Grieve, and, and, and all of the uh, staff that has uh, helped uh, put uh, this uh, series together. So thank you and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.